Chris Schwab is a bit is a is another one that kind of maybe falls into that lane of the Tiffany Cole thing that I mentioned previously. It's just a whereas I think with the Brendan Schaub issue, which you, you're probably not aware of, Brendan Schaub is a host of or one of the hosts on the Fighter and Kid, a very close friend of Joe Rogan. He's a former UFC fighter who's now gone into be a, uh, a comedian and an overall lifestyle uh, podcaster and just an all around you know um, entertainment dude doing some cool and interesting stuff. But it's been interesting to watch from the outside in, being a big T Fat K uh, viewer. Uh, that's the fire and the kid acronym, but it's been a big. Uh, it's been interesting to watch it from afar, just how quickly the fans have turned on him. Like you know, like um, every YouTuber has that thing where the fans turn on you. I think recently H three H three, Ethan Klein kind of went through that. Um, where when they started stopped kind of uploading their video, stop uploading the videos they did on their main channel, and essentially started up a podcast, and you know just essentially uh, bin the whole sketches on YouTube thing, and just concentrate more on the podcast and it kind of riled up their original fan base especially when uh, in a podcast especially in the two hour format or in even an hour format like i'm talking here you you guys you know you guys get to know me quite well i'm pretty consistent in my personality i'm not trying to be something i'm not on this platform so i think it's the same with somebody like an ethan klein who has a bigger platform than i have so i think fans got to maybe it was maybe a shock and surprise to see that the person that you liked in those 10 minute video segments was a different person when you sit them down and talk for an hour so, you know, some some of these personality quirks that people weren't really too fond of came to bear. And, you know, the whole hate um, Ethan Klein train kept chugging along. Now it's kind of stalled a little bit, but it feels like the Brendan Schaub hate train hasn't stopped moving. It, it's, it's intensified as the kind of years are progressing as he's got more successful. And I think it's understandable. I think it makes a lot of sense because unlike Tiffany Colvin and the DJing thing, Oh, maybe it's the same. Maybe it's the same, yeah. I think because Brennan Schaub's a comedian, or he's trying to be a stand-up comedy, a comedian, I think he's three years into it now, and he's got so much so quickly in his early part of his career. And this, you know, by and large, the stand-up industry is very much... Um, the, 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 the arc or the kind of trajectory of you to kind of get to the top is kind of, you know, it's a story that we all know. Open mics, hustle for ages, you only get good up maybe after 10 years, and then you start making it maybe after 20 it's just about a game about just staying hanging in there, you know, for, for dear life and then hoping some chances come along your way and hoping you have enough self awareness and the talent and hard and good work ethic to kind of recognize your flaws, write new jokes and just keep getting up again and again and again and again and again. Right? That's just essentially what the what the trip is. But Brennan Shaw obviously flipped that on his head by being extremely popular on the very well, being one of one of one of the uh driving forces behind a very popular podcast that kind of garnered a large audience and then kind of segueing that audience into his comedy career, which then allowed him to kind of leapfrog the entirety of that whole open mic stage uh, time thing. You know, I'm pretty sure he mentioned a few times in interviews, his first time performing quote unquote stand up was in front of a sold out crowd, right? Like that came to specifically see him. And when you're doing open mics and I know this from doing open decks as a DJ, Everywhere you go, no one wants you to be there, right? So you're having to fight that battle from the beginning. And also you're surrounded by people who are terrible for the most part. If you're in that kind of open mic, open deck arena, most people that you're standing with are not going to be the next, you know, Carl Cox. They're not going to be the next Eddie Murphy. We know that for real. So to, to, to so, so for somehow to kind of rise from that debris of um, awful, average, untalented people and actually make it is a you know once in a million chance like for brendan to go from literal zero to where he is now with the showtime special it makes sense that some comedians won't like him and wouldn't have a good thing to say about him but i think the hate on the forums has got a bit crazy and i think um this comment from uh Luis J. gomez kind of speaks upon it because Luis J. gomez and brendan have kind of had a little bit of a subliminal you know, beef here and there, I think, because of what Brendan Schaub said about Ellis Mania, because I think Brian Callum went to fight on there one time, and then Brendan was like, that's a terrible idea, why would you do that? And there's kind of like been a bit of a weird little beef between them, right? And I, mean, I, I just imagine the way the Legion of Skanks people are, and how they kind of go hard in their pain, and in the most offensive podcast in the world, I imagine that kind of humour, or that kind of busting of the balls doesn't really um, vibe well with Brendan. I think I, men- I remember him mentioning something along the lines of being in the green room and being really hurt that Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Jessonek said something really mean about him on stage when he came and kind of introduced him. And, you know, if you know anything about Jessonek, you know that that's kind of his humour. That's his, essentially his stick. But I just think he doesn't really do well with that kind of humour. So I'd imagine that's why it didn't work out. But I think this comment by Luis J. Gomez really did, or Luis J. Gomez, sorry, really did um, speak to 
the idea that I think sometimes fans can build up a narrative in their head as to why people hate this person. And also, it sometimes isn't that serious. Um, I think comedians, especially if you're not successful, you're, you, I think you should be, you should be, um, you should be allowed to hate Brendan Shaw if you're a comedian and you're not successful. Because if he's three years in and he's like, let's get this Instagram up, right? If he's three years in and he's able to, I don't know, what's that picture? If he's three years in and he's got a car like this and you're a stand-up comedian, I get that you hate the guy. I understand it, right? And if we're looking at this picture of a Porsche 911, I think um, in some amazing Tiffany blue color with these great rims and, you know, bright yellow um, brake pads, it makes sense to hate the guy because you're in the trenches and he's kind of leapfrogged what you're doing. Obviously, it's not going to serve you in the long term. You probably need to kind of focus more on what this guy's doing right and what you're doing wrong and kind of trying to copy that in your own way to see if that's going to help your career go forward. But it makes sense for some communities maybe to have some ill will to say about him. But I think for the fans outside of it who are kind of watching from the sidelines, I think it's getting a bit OTT. And also, I think you have to realize that sometimes people are just like, this is just a, this is life. This is like, Brendan Shaw is a representation of what happens in life every day. My first job, I was, yeah, I didn't get my first job until I was like maybe 18, 19. And that only came because I mentioned previously, my dad's friend, or my uncle, sorry, was uh, was basically the janitor of Hollywood Bowl, which is a, a big uh, bowling arcade thing that we used to have here in London that closed down a while back. But he was a janitor then. He basically, essentially gave me a good word to the manager. They got me in. They sold the gig as some other thing. And then when I started, I was just working behind the, the chicken nugget stand, right? Doing my thing. No no bother. But I was happy, in it. I was making my little money. I was able to take girls out on dates, get my, you know, tractors from JD Sports, living a good life. But I only got that job because my uncle got me. That's it. He brought me in. I was handing out CVs for like a good two summers, constantly going out, photocopying stuff. Like, you know, handing out CVs. Every shop I could go, Poundland, whatever. It doesn't matter. Any shop I'd go to. I didn't get one callback, no intro, nothing. Obviously, at that time, I didn't have any experience, even on paper. So I understood why they, I wasn't a good candidate. But I only got my job because my uncle. And I think that is an accurate representation of life. Sometimes people just get lucky breaks or they know the right people and they are able to kind of get forward in life. And that is just the way it is. Now, it's not always fair. We know that. But life isn't fair. That's just the general reality of it. But I think some people on that, on that subreddit, especially the, the Fire and Kids subreddit, they have it in their head that, I don't know, that he shouldn't be this rich and shouldn't be this successful he's been able to make it as a stand-up comedian in another unconventional way i think it should be celebrated i think it should be heralded in some regard whether or not he deserves to be on certain platforms is up for debate who really cares about it but i think if you're if you're a, a person watching for the sidelines and you're just a you know a fan of the podcast to kind of snipe at him and to kind of create this division between the comedians is weird because i think deep down even the comedians that don't like the guy have to respect the hustle in it he, he took the a really popular podcast and kind of you know, uh, segued it into a really successful stand-up career that led to other kind of opportunities, that should be heralded. That is essentially what everyone's doing nowadays, right? Everyone's got a podcast. Everyone's got um, their own little quote-unquote um, marketing platform in terms of an Instagram profile. Everyone's posting or trying to catch a lick on Twitter and post something viral or make a, a really good meme or go back and forth with a really influential YouTuber like Chris Delia went back with, you, with um, Jake Paul maybe do a really viral video like Burt Kreischer and Tom Segura, right? Everyone's trying to do something. Everyone's got their little different avenues that they're kind of uh, going on in order to kind of gain you a new audience or kind of increase their exposure. That's what everyone should be doing. Now, whether or not, you know, the level of success he has matches his quote-unquote um, journey, journey in the whole thing overall is maybe up for debate, but it doesn't, it's not even... But it's not even worth talking about because it is what it is, isn't it? But I think Lucio Gomez spoke about it really well in this little um, ramble that he had when he was on Twitch. I'm going to definitely play it for you now so you guys can hear it. Let me just take it off the screen so I can get it up for you. But I thought this really spoke about it well. And I think hopefully this goes a long way to kind of quelling some of the um, victory against him on the t on his subreddit. Because I know a lot of podcasts, especially Ethan Klein on H3, like they, I think even your mum's house, they do it. They go through their Reddit and kind of, you know, maybe find topics to talk about, maybe someone posts some good clips or something, but I don't think the Finding Kids staff can ever go on that subreddit, the Finding the Kids subreddit especially, and get anything helpful from there because the, everyone on there absolutely hates the guy. Like, they hate him for real. They hate his guts. Like, and I've never seen such vitriol, such anger towards him. Um, but let's play the video first and then I'll, I'll, I'll get a little comment up that says, that basically breaks down why some people hate him so much. Yeah, nobody, nobody really has a problem with Brendan Schaub. 
That's why you guys are fucking like, everyone's like, one of the floodgates coming up, but one of the gloves coming off. Why don't you actually just fucking say it like it is? Won't you say, I hate Brendan Shaw. Fuck that guy. There's nobody that dislikes the guy. The guy's a nice guy, I believe. I mean, I only met him once. He was very nice when I met him. Uh, but you know the funny thing about this is that as funny as like, you know, as kind of um, respectful and honest as Louis J. Gomez is being, the Puerto Rican rattlesnake, if you've listened to Legion of Skanks, if you've listened to rap, you'll know that this guy says some wild stuff and you know that if he, like, you know that part of the reason why he's kind of holding back a little bit too has to do with Joe Rogan, which is another part of this, probably the story of, of uh, Brendan Shaw people don't like. You know, I think it's quite clear that if he didn't have a Joe Rogan in his corner, he wouldn't have been as successful as he is now in that kind of comedy space, maybe. I don't know. We can't really say for certain because podcasting is so big now he could have probably still been a level that he's at now. Segue that in somewhere if you like. But it's pretty obvious, obvious to us looking from the outside in that Joe Rogan, even though he's not, he doesn't really flex it that much. He is quite a well-respected and powerful person um, in comedy, in the comedy circuit, in the entertainment circuit. I'd imagine if you're a comedian and you have the opportunity to get on the Joe Rogan podcast, I, I you know what I judge it on. I judge it on um, what's his name? Uh, one one half from the uh, about last night podcast, Adam Ray went on Joey Diaz recently and um, Joey Diaz said in passing that Joe Rogan said he liked Adam Ray's set. Like, you know, said something nice about his set. And Adam Ray was like mentioning it two or three times again. Oh, did, did Joey say it? Joey say that? And that automatically made me think, especially as well thinking about how the Legion of Skanks were when they went on Joe Rogan the first time, how well behaved they were. It made me understand just how much um, reverence people treat Joe Rogan with, how much of a deity he is, how looked up, how people really respect this guy in this scene. So I'd imagine if you're a comedian and you get a, an opportunity to go on his platform a lot, like Brendan Schaub has because they're friends, they're best friends, and he kind of supports your career, he gives you good career advice, that it can obviously speed up your process, right? It can, you know, it's happened to authors. Authors go on his show on Joe Rogan's podcast and promote a book and the book sells out or it jumps up, you know, a million places on the New York Times bestseller list. It does help in that regard. But you also have to understand that comedy especially, you have to put bums in seats. He can, you know, Joe Rogan can help out Brendan Shaw, get him an introduction, maybe get him a few podcast sponsors, put some money in his pocket. But if Joe, if Brendan Shaw wants to feed his family, if he wants to, you know, ex- expand his family, he wants to provide for his family, wherever it may be, he's going to have to be good at his job. You, you know, it's like when they always mention about famous people when they go get up on stage and do a bit of time or try and pursue stand-up comedy. They get about maybe, what's that, three minutes on stage to kind of, you know... Um, use their celebrity to kind of get a few laughs after that you have to be funny you have to deliver the good so i think even though brendan shaw might have got an unfair leg up he still had to run the whole way right that's it he still had to run the whole way and um, and he's running he's been running consistently for a while if you've seen what he's looked like so far in these clips that he uploads onto youtube especially you know on instagram lately you can tell he's been you know working day in day out especially with a new kid on the way so i don't think it's anything that's been earned you know just because he knows joe but it's there it's obvious it's obvious you can tell that you know, Louis J doesn't want to piss off Joe Rogan too much by going at Brendan Shop too hard. Because again, why would you too as well? It's like, what, for the entertainment of like some, no, some, you know, some randoms on the Reddit. It doesn't make any sense in it, really. Um, yeah, I think that's why most comedians don't openly trash it. Um, yeah, it's as simple as that. Like, and then it's like, you know, comics, uh, there's like a fucking, there's a weird brotherhood, no matter how good or bad you might think somebody is. You know, even comics that I fucking hate, like fucking open mic, SJW, feministy, lesbian, fucking purple hair assholes that would hate me, that would literally try to take me down. I still have a weird sense of kinship with those people. So I think that which I which I like actually in comedy circuit, which you see a lot. Of, I think in the early days there was a lot more sniping or a lot more kind of gossip, but it wasn't like um um it wasn't like mean spirited. It was just like gossip. Oh, I can't believe they got that. I can't believe they got this. But it, I do like the kinship when someone's in trouble. No one tries to dog power alone, which is probably why you got such a um, Peyton Oswald and uh, Judd Apatow got such a negative reaction from the comedy from other fellow comedians when they started you know virtue signaling because for the most part no one does that even if people think you're horrible 
they're never gonna kind of dog pile on top of you. If 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 if, if anything, which I think is awesome, if 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 they think you're an untalented hack and you're suddenly getting attacked and and trying to get cancelled, you're probably gonna get more support from people that you probably would never think will support you because they feel a level of uh, kinship and they also know that that could easily be them so they want to put a good foot forward they want to also make an example that you know this is not what we don't do this and i guess in comedy too because it's so insular and because it's such a risque art form it sort of helps your career sometimes too you know look at um lou uh lou ck is a good example you know you can literally get away with anything if you you know to a, to a certain extent in comedy and as long as you do right by other comedians you should be okay you should be pretty fine you can kind of come back in and make a career for yourself but why you don't like there's just no reason it's not like he's a dude who's going out and fucking trashing people and being shitty to people exactly. you know what i'm saying like he just kind of i get it i get why people <laughs> the reason i take shots at him and again it's not his fault either he got a Showtime special in two. I think the Showtime special is a probably the big thing that he probably might look back on and maybe regret. I still think he didn't need to take it. He probably could have not taken it and probably done his, show, his special now after three years and been a lot better than what he was maybe at a two-year mark. It just wasn't good. Um, it, even just the outfit. I remember him talking such a big game about he spent so long about his outfit. He had it in mind for ages. And you look at the video, it's just him wearing all black with brightly colored trainers it wasn't as interesting of an outfit as he wears day to day when they're firing a kid he's probably had better outfits on the firing a kid than he's had ever on that on that um uh you'd be surprised uh special and also i think he wasted the name i think that you'd be surprised name should have been done as a debut now maybe five years in it's such a cool name for a special especially after the whole story you know with basically joe rogan uh telling him he should quit mma and you know uh brendan Shaw's reply you'd be surprised i think he wasted that that time that kind of that moment he probably should have done it again but again it's not his fault i get the whole rationale behind it there was a long-term plan in terms of him being associated with showtime and it's worked out pretty well from his career why you can't say it's a mistake but i think in terms of the vitriol that he happens with the community that's where it comes from but we can move away from this because that's what luke J. gomez is basically speaking about you can kind of watch the video yourself but i think there's a comment on reddit that kind of expands on why people exactly don't like him and again i think it just it's a bit short-sighted, I think, in my experience. But let me see if I can get it up on here for you guys to see. Um, so this is a re this is some a reason why someone said I think this is a clip of Brendan talking on a show. Uh, and here's what he says. Oh yeah, so this, this is a clip of Brendan talking. This is a response from him, right? So this is, I'm gonna get this up on Reddit here. Uh, this is Brendan talking about haters because he does this a lot and I think this is what uh, annoys the haters I think it's just like stop mentioning it he does always say he doesn't read comments but you know he probably does and it's just it just stirs the pot more it's just annoying isn't it for the people that are sniping him for him himself just completely ignore it and just keep it moving but this is what he said right they can't even imagine this and when they when they were kids their dreams weren't to be these losers in their mom's basement hating on successful people, so they have just such resentment against people who are doing great creative shit, you know? 100%. So he's obviously talking happen. about himself, but in this regard, the resentment isn't just because he's successful. I think someone pointed out in the comments and said, uh, no one hates successful people for doing great creative work. We hate Brendan Shaw because, or Slob, they mentioned here, being super disrespectful because um, he's a beneficiary, the benefit the beneficiary sorry of undeserved success he's a comic who can't tell a joke and a commentator who can't speak properly he's a stupid arrogant bully who has consistently failed upwards people have an innate sense of fairness and although we admire success we despise undeserved success that's why we hate you brendan because there is there if there were any justice in the world you'd be bartending in your hometown effing your friends wives and drunkenly contemplating suicide jesus christos instead of getting rich as an entertainer now obviously the last couple of sentences are a little bit mean and a bit over the top but the general sentiment from these people on the outside again they're not comedians other com or even maybe other comedians other comedians have got legitimate reasons not to like the guy they can just say look He's three years in. He's got Showtime special. Um, you know, he's got a great look, looking family, big mansion, great cars, all the trappings of material success, great network of friends, seemingly, and he seems to be living a happy life. It's annoying. I get it. If you're a, a comedian, because he's got success that doesn't make any sense for a comedian but again you have to understand he's not really a comedian he's more of a podcaster which is probably a lot more lucrative than his comedy career he'd probably have to say i don't know would he say that maybe not i don't i'm not just sure i don't know anyone's pockets 
But I think for the commentators outside, again, it goes back to the Tiffany Cover thing that I mentioned in the other bit of the segment of the show. People don't. People are really naive about how people actually make it. Some people make it because of their friends or because of their network. That's why a lot of successful people, when they're telling you about their story, some will say, I got lucky. Some will say, it's who you know. Some will say, this person changed my life. Because what happened in that story is that they were doing the work. For instance, if you're a stand-up comedian, they were doing the bare minimum, which which you have to do to enter, to kind of be part of the conversation. Write your own material, go up consistently, and keep it new and fresh and interesting, right? Learn from your mistakes, all that sort of stuff. So you're doing the bare minimum. You're going up every day or every week, wherever it may be. You're writing new stuff every day. You're trying to change up your set. You're self-reflective. Um, you're aware, you're not being deluded and you're constantly trying to bring it every time you go up on stage, right? You're doing the bare minimum. Then along that journey, whether it's two year, three year, four year, five year, if you happen to be lucky enough to bump into a really amazing producer or agent or manager who's able to, you know, take your career, you know, five years forward in the space of maybe a couple of months, what are you meant to do? Are you meant to not take that chance? Are you meant to say, oh, no, man, I can't do that because I want people on Reddit thinking that I'm, un- I'm an undeserved success story. That's ridiculous. You should take that chance. And what makes um, Brennan Schaub's story even more interesting is that he's been able to kind of, again, take the, plat- the, the, the podcasting platform and immediately just slap alongside it, being a con- commentator, an analyst, a lifestyle podcast host, a comedian, all these other things on top of it. And it's been able to kind of grow exponentially because if he's a stand-up comedian and he goes, and he goes to a comedy club, you know, he's, he can legitimately say, look, I can sell tickets for this place. I can sell this place out. What's, what are the comedy clubs meant to do? Get him to do an open mic set get him to do a nine to ten set in a random town no you might just give him the whole evening let him bring his own openers in let him actually you know sell some tickets get some people in sell some drinks sell some food and keep making money but so that's that, that's the thing that you don't, I just don't get with some people that are on reddit like are you not in a real world have you never been in a job where someone's got a promotion that they don't deserve because they know the manager like it happens all the time but then once you've got the job you still have to perform that's the thing that people are uh, misunderstanding. I don't think there's many people in big, higher-up positions who don't know what they're doing. For the most part, they might not be as proficient as you want them to be, but they know some aspects of the jobs. And they might not be... They might not have got the job the way you wanted it to get the job, but that's the way the world works. Sometimes people get stuff... You know, just, I don't know what you, what you can say. Like that, that's, that's a major part of the success story of being able to have cultivated network. So, again, I don't blame I don't blame him, man. I think it's a good thing, actually. I think, again, it goes to show that there's other ways to get money, other ways to succeed in the comedy business, especially, you know, looking at how it must have been for the previous people in, the, in, a, you know, in an era where people were looking to get TV deals and stuff. Imagine now, if you're a stand-up comedian, you probably don't need to travel much to make a lot of money. You can essentially make a lot of money through podcasting uploading videos on youtube You're, you can upload your clips on youtube maybe get bookings that way and tour you know for maybe four months of the year maybe if that and you know still look after your family provide <clears throat> why wouldn't you do that so again I, I'm, I'm not too sure why why everyone's sniping again i think maybe it is a little bit of undeserving success thing a bit of jealousy i don't know but the vitro on that four on that subreddit mate i recommend no one from their team check it because they hate the guy super hard i just don't understand i really don't